NASA will soon launch the Parker Solar Probe, which will travel closer to the surface of the sun than any spacecraft ever. Now on its journey, it will have to be able to survive extreme temperatures, perform complicated gravity assists, be able to measure the ever-changing magnetic field of a star, as well as try and uncover the secrets that Dr. Parker himself theorized 60 years ago. So how will the probe be able to do it? Let's talk about that. If you are interested in a brief overview of the purpose of the mission, be sure to check out the shorter version of this video, where I go into why this is important, as well as a little bit about how the mission is going to work. The Parker Solar Probe is named after the astrophysicist Dr. Eugene Parker, which this is actually the first NASA mission to ever be named after a living scientist. Now the origin of this topic actually dates back to the early 1950s. There were a few observations that tried to understand the formation of comets, or more specifically, how their tails acted in such a way in the opposite direction of the sun, no matter which direction they are traveling. Now at the time, Dr. Parker was interested in a very small section of this study. More specifically, some of the researchers had theorized that there are energetic particles coming from the sun. So Dr. Parker looked into this observation and tried to analyze how exactly energetic particles would travel throughout the solar system, or more specifically, how could they be created from the sun and then travel out past Earth, and how could they even have an effect on us? Now through his calculations, taking into account the rotation of the sun as well as the magnetic field, he was able to predict the motion of these particles. More specifically, when you're close to the sun, the particles travel outwards in a radial direction, basically in the opposite direction of the sun. However, as you get further and further away from the star, the magnetic field played more of an impact, creating somewhat of a spiral pattern going throughout the solar system. So this is actually the drawing that Dr. Parker put in his first proposal of what this could be. Now after the paper was published, there were many skeptics and it wasn't actually fully accepted until 10 years later when the first satellite data would actually prove that Dr. Parker was correct. But let's jump back to the Parker Solar Probe. Its purpose is to be able to understand the formation of these solar winds by traveling into the corona of a star, or more specifically, our sun. Now getting this close to the sun actually requires quite a bit of energy. We have to slow down a lot, therefore we're going to use gravity assist. But not one, not two, but seven gravity assists of the planet Venus. Now, what is a gravity assist? This is a maneuver that uses the relative motion of a planet, its rotation, and its overall gravitational effect to either speed up or slow down a satellite. And in this case, we're using it to slow down our probe. Now, by slowing it down, we'll be able to lower the perihelion of its orbit, or in other words, we'll be lowering the distance between the sun and the probe at its closest approach to the sun. Now this will allow our closest approach to be just over 6 million kilometers away from the sun. And this might sound like a lot, however the corona of the star actually reaches out to 8 million kilometers. Therefore we're entering the upper atmosphere of the sun itself. Now the corona of a star is able to accelerate solar winds to up to 700,000 kilometers per hour, which is incredibly quick. However the corona is probably most well known here on Earth for what happens during a total solar eclipse. During totality, you're able to see the corona, which is actually the only part of the sun you're able to see. Now, a strange fact about the corona is even though it's the outermost part of the star, it's actually the hottest, ranging in temperatures of 500,000 degrees Celsius to over a million degrees Celsius. So how is our spacecraft able to survive such high temperatures? Well, the first thing you need to realize is that temperature and heat are not the same thing. A great example of this is taking someone that goes outside when it's freezing out versus going into a lake when the lake is freezing. You can probably imagine that one of which is incredibly colder. For example, a human can survive outside when it's freezing for well over a day depending on how well their body is adjusted to the temperature. However, when a person jumps into a freezing lake, most likely they're going to go unconscious in less than 15 minutes and probably die within an hour. So these differences are rather strange, yet it's the same temperature. So what's going on here? Well, heat transfer is all about the density of the molecules you're in contact with. 
So for example, water is a thousand times as dense as air. Therefore, it has a much higher impact on how well it can transfer heat from your body to the surrounding area, which is why you would go unconscious in just 15 minutes of being in freezing water, whereas you would be perfectly fine for 15 minutes just being outside when it's cold. Now let's jump back to the corona. It's actually 10,000 times less dense than air. Therefore, the heat transfer is incredibly small when we look at how hot the temperature ranges in that region, which is kind of strange to think about, but it still gets really warm. Since you're so close to the sun, we have to worry more about radiation from the sun, which can actually bring the temperature of the probe up to 1377 degrees Celsius, which is still way too hot for our electronics, so we have to keep it cool. So how is the Parker probe able to do it? Well, as I mentioned, it's radiative heat, therefore it's coming from the direction of the sun, which means we can create a heat shield that basically blocks our electronics or creates a shadow for us to be able to operate our instruments in. Now the heat shield is made out of reinforced carbon carbon, which is actually what the nose of the space shuttle was made out of. Not the tiles, but just the nose. Now the inside of the heat shield is carbon carbon foam, but it's 97% empty. And this is primarily because we don't want the heat to conduct through the spacecraft. So if we have a lot of empty space, it won't be able to move freely throughout the surface and rather have a hard time to get from the front to the heat shield to the back. Now the shield is incredibly important to keeping our electronics alive. For example, if it's misaligned for just a minute, that would destroy all the electronics on board the spacecraft and make the mission a failure. But what makes this even more difficult is when the spacecraft is this close to the sun, it takes us eight minutes to send a signal to it and eight minutes to hear back. Therefore, we can't just be controlling it like a joystick here on Earth. So we actually had to teach the spacecraft to align itself. It has four sensors on the edges that are able to detect the luminosity of the region it's in. If it sees that it's actually much brighter than it's supposed to, that means that the probe is misaligned and that the heat shield needs to protect the instruments from the hot temperatures. So it's actually very autonomous. And some engineers even say it's one of the most autonomous spacecraft that NASA have ever built, primarily because the entire mission is critical dependent on whether or not it can align itself with the sun just perfectly. Now, not all parts of the spacecraft are blocked by the heat shield. It is powered by solar panels. So another way to keep the system cool is by using a water cooling method. Basically, they're able to run water behind the solar panels where it's much hotter. The water then heats up, taking the heat from the panels, and then it travels to the back end of the spacecraft where it's much cooler near the vacuum of space, and then it radiates that heat off into space. And thus, this cycle keeps the overall temperature of the spacecraft near 30 degrees Celsius. Now, once the spacecraft actually gets this close to the sun, it has to do what the entire mission is planned for, conducting experiments. Now, the first instrument is called Fields, and it's mainly focused on trying to understand the magnetic and electrical fields when it enters the corona or gets close to the sun which will help us understand how exactly they're accelerating so rapidly. Now this instrument is mainly consisted of five antennas, each two meters long, four of which that actually reach outside of the range of the heat shield. However, they're made up of neobium titanium alloy, which is able to withstand temperatures up to 2,500 degrees Celsius. Therefore, it's easily able to survive the 13 to 1400 degrees Celsius range that it's in. Now those antennas are specifically focused on understanding the electrical field, and there are three magnetometers on board that are gonna focus on understanding the magnetic field. But what's kind of insane about these magnetometers is they're able to take measurements up to two million measurements per second. And that is a lot of data. So now let's go over to the second instrument, which is called Whisper and it is actually the only optical instrument on board, meaning that it is going to be taking images of what's going on when we get close to the sun. And more specifically, it's acting as a supplement to see if we can try and visualize some of the things that we're able to record with some of the other instruments. Now the third instrument is called Sweep, 
and this is trying to understand the velocity, temperature, and density of the particles that are flying by the spacecraft. And more specifically, it's looking at the electrons, protons, and helium ions that are flying by. Now this is important because by understanding the velocity or the speed, we're able to see how quickly the solar winds are moving at different distances from the sun. And by understanding the temperature and the density, do those things sound familiar? We'll be able to understand the energy transfer or the heat that is within the solar winds. Therefore, we could try and understand how much energy is being put into the solar winds and how quickly it's happening. Now, the last experiment is called ESIS, and the name may look a little bit funny, and that's because the O in the middle of the name is actually the symbol for the sun. Now, ESIS is kind of like an advanced version of a sweep. It's gonna not only look at electrons, protons, and helium ions, but it's also gonna be looking at what electrons have been emitted from other elements nearby, whether it be oxygen, nitrogen, neon, iron, many others, and try and understand what's going on in this environment. It's trying to figure out where these particles are coming from and how they might be obtaining this energy. So ESIS is basically asking, where are you coming from? And SWEEP is saying, where are you going? Now with all this information, hopefully scientists are able to better understand where solar winds come from and how they're able to gain so much energy so quickly. And if we're able to understand the formation of solar winds, we'll be able to predict them more accurately and therefore protect our satellites as well as future astronauts when they travel further than they've ever gone before. So which instrument do you think is going to make some of the greatest discoveries out of the ones I mentioned? And are you excited to see the images that come from the Whisper experiment? Personally, I am, but I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments below. Also, as a quick note, I'm going to be moving around a lot over the next couple weeks, so there might not be two episodes a week, but I'm going to try and get at least one every Thursday. But thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.